So I'm gonna tell you a bit about some of my new perspectives on learning and language. And let's start with the field of natural language processing. It's evident, I think, in the last couple of years that we've made a tremendous amount of progress as a field, as a community. We have now systems that can recognize speech that power digital assistants. We have systems that can translate between 100 different languages. And we also have systems that can read uh, documents and answer questions about them, which is a topic that uh, my research group has been heavily involved in in recent years. Um, and a lot of this uh, success of these language technologies has been driven by uh, machine learning models, notably deep learning. Um, but in this talk, I want to explore a different idea. Can we turn it at the tables around a little bit? And can we think about what can language do for machine learning? Okay, so this is an intriguing idea that I think I want to, um, am excited to explain to you guys. But first of all, we have to think about language as not just simply passive text that exists on the internet waiting to be analyzed. I think we have to go back to the roots of where language came from, which is this communication system that humans developed or evolved as a way to survive. And this is kind of, the, if you th think about it deeply, language is really a kind of what um, gives rise to civilizations, allows us to transmit ideas across you know, large distances and across time. And so it's a very powerful thing. So how can we do language not for, learning not for language, but the other way around? So let's focus now on machine learning. So this is a very cartoon idea of how machine learning works today. Um, you gather a lot of examples demonstrating a particular behavior like that your system would, um, should have. And in this simple example, we have colored bars, and each bar is labeled uh, either a one or a zero. Okay, so if I gave you all this um, in data, can you figure out what um, the classifier is? So maybe take uh, 10 seconds to look. Just shout it out if you... Red and blue. Okay, don't, don't worry if you, you didn't get it. It's, it's, um, it's not supposed to be, t you could probably do it, uh, but it's, it's not you know, trivial. And machines can probably do it faster than, um, because it can sift through all the different patterns, right? But there's a, in some sense, there's a much easier way to do this, in the, at least in this example. So I could have also just showed you, the ones are exactly those bars that have at least two red squares. Right, and in an instant, you immediately, all of you, can understand exactly what I mean. Right, so this kind of uh, toy example shows the potential power of language because it allows you to express the concepts directly without leaving things to kind of statistical chance. Right, and another thing I want to point out is that actually, you know, if you look at this, another th concept that is consistent with the data is also at least two blue squares, right? So. But in this particular example, maybe I wanted the actual system to look, pay attention to red squares. So this is an example where, by using language, you can actually give information which is not present in the data. Okay. So in the remaining time, I want to explore two implementations of this uh, general idea. Um, the first is this project that we worked on last year, collaborate with, collaboration with um, Chris Ray's group on uh, training classifiers from natural language explanations. So the setting you should imagine is you're trying to build an information extraction system, something that could go on the web, read a lot of documents, and mine information into a structured format. And to build such a system, traditionally you would need training data. So here's how it normally works. You go show an annotator an interface where you have a sentence, Tom Brady, blah, 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 and you ask the question, is person one married to person two? So suppose for this instant, we're somehow interested in uh, celebrities, but you can imagine other types of relations. Um, and they would have to read it, and then they click either yes or no. But the thing is that most of the time is actually spent reading and understanding, right? The actual clicking of yes or no is uh, pretty trivial. But the amount of information we're getting from this process is just one bit, a yes or a no. Right? So something seems, um, it seems like we should be able to do a little bit better. So what we decided is, can we um, get a little bit more information from the annotator? So we asked them to write an explanation showing their work. Why did you think that this, your answer was true? And in, the, in this case, someone might have written because the words his wife are to the right of person two. So these explanations, 
think about them as general rules of thumb, not necessarily correct or, or wrong. Okay, so what do we do with these explanations now? Right, there's that natural language, and one of the hard difficulties is, well, natural language understanding isn't that actually um, that easy. But we'll show that we can actually make progress on this as follows. So we, um, our group has actually been working a lot on semantic parsing, this field of converting natural language sentences into computer programs that can be executable. So an explanation like, because his words, his wife are right of uh, person two, so that's a string. We can convert it into what is called a labeling function using a uh, semantic parser, where the labeling function takes uh, any sentence and then returns either one or a zero depending on whether that explanation actually holds or not. Right, so now we have kind of embodied this vague kind of natural language into something very precise that is executable. And the way we do this, I'm not going into the details, but it's uh, actually we use a rule-based semantic parser which is sufficient for our purposes here. Okay, so now you have explanations converted into labeling functions. Now you can run these labeling functions on all your unlabeled data, which we assume to be plentiful. So we have a lot of unlabeled data, but not so much uh, labeled data. And so we get essentially a lot of noisily labeled examples from our explanations. Okay, so now we can aggregate these examples to kind of denoise the data set a little bit. So you should think about it as um, you have for every column, you have a particular unlabeled example, which is a sentence of example. Every row is an explanation which gives rises to a labeling function. And every cell is either the labeling function says it was positive, negative, or um, it could be abstain as well. So there's many ways of doing uh, this aggregation, but essentially what you want to do is take the, all the, the labels down the columns and either do a majority vote or use something um, fancier like data programming to produce um, a set of uh, labels. Okay, so now at this point, you basically have a large uh, label training set. So not all of the labels are correct, but um, it's, it's large, okay? So now using this la label data set, you can now go train your favorite um, classifier, logistic regression or neural net or a decision tree or whatever, okay. So how well does this work in practice? So we tested this on three relation extraction data sets, um, detecting whether two people are spouses, detecting whether a chemical and a disease are uh, related, and detecting whether a protein and a um, kinase are you know, related. Um, so here are the, the results. So um, actually, is there a clicker here? I mean, uh, um, okay, let me see if this... I don't know if this is working. Anyway, so um, so the top shows the number of inputs, uh, where number of examples which are labeled by traditional supervision. So TS stands for traditional supervision. And you can see that as the number of examples goes from 30 to 60 to 150, the numbers, uh, the accuracy gets better, right? From 15, which is unusable, to something like um, you know 50. But it takes thousands of examples to get there. Right, so the left column, leftmost column, is our approach where we're asking people to give 30 explanations. Um, and then we use this procedure to convert those explanations into uh, labeling functions, label a large uh, unlabeled corpus, and train a model. And from, you see that from 30 explanations for spouse, we're already at you know, 50 F1, which is equivalent to having thousands of uh, traditionally labeled examples. Okay, we should check that um, the cost of producing explanations. Um, empirically, we sh found that explanations take only twice as long to get as uh, traditional labels, again, because most of the time is spent actually reading and understanding and not clicking uh, the yes or no. So overall, taking that into account, we found that uh, depending on the data set, we were getting between three and 50 times um, efficiency by using explanations as opposed to uh, simply um, labeling. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to a second topic, which is um, learning from definitions. So this is joint work with um, um, Sita and Sam and Chris. <coughs> so the setting here is that, um, imagine building a natural language interface. Um, so imagine you're kind of a graphic designer, and it would be nice if you can kind of create scenes by just you know, using natural language. 
right? So add two chairs five spaces apart, it would produce this kind of beautiful you know, rendition. And in this setting, um, if you look closely, these are kind of voxels. So imagine that you have basically a, a little building blocks, kind of like almost Minecraft, if, you, if that um, um, resonates with you. Um, and you're trying to build these elaborate scenes out of very small building blocks, okay? So this is um, a, a pretty hard problem, right? Going from something so high level like adding two chairs to the kind of minute details that you need to execute this, uh, this scene. And you know, existing methods would just completely fail uh, on this. Um, so what should we do? Well, if I were to t teach you how to do this, you know, I would probably try to explain it. And one way I would explain it is trying to break it down. So I might say, okay, here's, here's how it works, right? You first add a chair, and then you move five spaces to the left, and then you add another chair, right? And then you, you might not know, you know how to build chairs, so I can say, okay, here's how you build chairs. Chairs have legs, a chair base, and a chair back, and so on. And we can kind of go down until at the level of saying, add a red block. And then you know, anyone can kind of understand that. So, so the idea is to take something very complex and try to decompose it via explanation and iterative explanations to get to the point where we actually, um, the, the, the system can actually understand. Okay, so the way we implemented this is we started with a, a grammar. So the grammar defines essentially a programming language. But the syntax of the programming language is um, natural language-like. So you can type things like repeat three, add brown top, which is not natural language, but it's hopefully somewhat intuitive enough for people to get kind of get started with. And then we put people in front of this interface, right? Um, and then we had them say, go build things. Okay, so here's what happens. If they, suppose you want to build two palm trees, right? So you say add palm tree. If the system happens to understand you, then all is well, you get your palm tree, and then you can move on. But uh, if the system doesn't understand, for example, add yellow palm tree, um, then you can have the opportunity of teaching the system by breaking it down. You say, okay, first add a green palm tree, palm trees are generally green, um, and then you um, change the green to a yellow. So that's how you would um, teach the system, okay, you can take green palm trees and make them yellow, okay? And now you hit save, and what, you, what happens? You get your palm tree, and you also have given the system a, um, a training example that it can use to make further progress. So it's kind of a win-win situation. In both cases, you get your palm tree, and then in, if the system doesn't understand, then you have an opportunity to teach the system. So each interaction produces a tree, um, in the computer science sense, not in the botanical sense, um, where the system understands uh, the leaves of this tree. So this is a very rich um, training example, right? Instead of having, say, add palm tree, and then magically here is your, your palm tree, you have a finely articulated description of how the palm tree is kind of structed, constructed from the trunk and the, the leaves and so on. Okay, so with these kind of traces, uh, we can, um, now do some learning. So the learning looks like uh, grammar induction. So remember that the initial model was just a set of uh, grammar rules that could parse uh, essentially a you know, program language. And now each definition gives you a new rule or a set of new rules. So if you had define add brown top three times, which is the head of the definition to repeat three add brown top, the algorithm would simply look at the cases, uh, the entities that show up in both the head and the body, for example, three and um, brown, um, you would kind of generalize that to, so that you can um, use four instead of three or red instead of brown. So you would add a rule like add CD times maps to repeat and add CD, and you might abstract even further. Right, so one thing to note is that all of these rules that are being added are coming from users, which we don't expect to be um, kind of uh, necessarily accurate all the time. So what we do is we throw these rules in, and they might be kind of multiple rules which are clashing in some way, but all this uncertainty is uh, still resolved by a log linear model. So you can think about the system of rules as basically defining um, a possible output space of the model, 
And then you're still using machine learning to kind of tease apart based on that context, like which, which uh, particular rule to invoke at a particular time. Okay, so just quickly, the, the results we got. So we ran this uh, experiment on Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, for three days. We had about 40 people come and we qualify them um, based on some kind of test. And then we set up a leaderboard and say, go at it. Try to build something interesting without kind of any further guidance. But you, the only way you can remember you can build things is by typing into a text box. So you have to use natural language, right? So this is kind of interesting because language becomes a means toward an end. It, it becomes a kind of mechanism by which um, users are able to accomplish their goals, in this case, building a, um, some sort of a, um, a scene. And the results, well, visually you can see kind of what people were able to come up with. This was definitely um, beyond my expectations in terms of, you know, there's a lot of creative talent out there on, uh, on Mechanical Turk, it turns out. And in the process, they were t teaching the system different things such as ad read top four times. So it's things like paraphrasing things into more natural ways of saying something. And then also defining higher level concepts like cube is not something that the system knew about, but you define here is a cube and it's constructed based on um, you know, whatever collection of uh, you know, voxels that you have. Right? So the system is kind of learning in a very kind of uh, you know, structural and uh, deep sense here. Okay, so just to wrap up, the main takeaway I, got, I, guess, I guess I want you to guys to think about is language is not simply uh, producing data that was waiting to be analyzed, but a tool that can be used to communicate. So a lot of NLP works on you know, analyzing text written by humans for other humans, whereas I think this is really interesting to explore how language can be used as a tool for communicating with you know, computers. And I've argued that language can be tremendously valuable for machine learning, even if you're not interested in per se, a language application per se. We showed there are two possible uh, implementations. One is learning from explanations, so you can build classifiers much more quickly than before. And another one is using definitions so you can build up more complex uh, concepts than you were able to do before. And so this vastly speeds up and expands the scope of learning. Um, and I, I would say that this is kind of still a nascent um, area of, of research. Uh, we show kind of two examples of this in practice, but I expect that this is only the uh, tip of the iceberg. So that's all I have. Thanks to all the collaborators and funding sources. So thanks for your time. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If Hello. Hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have a question about the first part of your presentation. So you gave the husband and wife example. Uh, what if the relation uh, requires uh, inference using something that is mentioned outside that piece of text that is shown to the annotator? So if the classification depends on kind of external knowledge, not just based on the text, you know, what would happen? Um, so this has more to do with how you set up the classification task in the first place, as opposed to you know, how you collect data for it. Um, I think there are, you know, in this space of relation extraction, you can imagine showing more context. Um, and al also, annotators are always going to bring in, you know, background knowledge and common sense from the knowledge. You can either make it explicit in an interface, or maybe you can give them kind of a search tool to look at, you know, other documents. Um, great talk. So I have one quick question. So how do you generalize explanation? So for example, if explanation says, I spam email, this is a spam email, it contains a million dollars. How do you generalize that a spam email typically contains some monetary amount? So how, the question is, how do you generalize uh, explanations? Um, I mean, one comment is that the explanations themselves are already at some level of generality. Like when you say a spam email, is, email is spam because it contains like dollar amounts. That's already a general rule. It's not a particular ex example. Um, one thing that I didn't get a chance to talk about is the data programming model actually uh, provides additional generalization beyond what you specified because you're 
the rules that you specify or the explanations which give rise to labeling functions um, captures only kind of very, um, a very precise kind of um, you know, a reason. But when you then you have all these examples, and now you feed this into a machine learning algorithm, and it can feel free to look at other signals that you didn't specify before. And those, therefore, it might be able to make additional generalizations uh, beyond what you specified in the, in the beginning. All right, last question. Uh, so the, I could see an amazing use case, which is like, you know, imposing regulations from governments because the definition is precise to any industry. Yeah. But from the, the non-regulatory part, I was wondering how your definitions would limit uh, the amount of inference that you could have received, you know, from this ton of data that you had. Because it seems like you're building blocks of definitions as imposed by you. So you're kind of like imposing an you're starting with a bias uh, in a way to on, on the insights you can extract from your data. Yeah, so generally the question is um, how do the definitions which are kind of very precise and top-down interact with more the general, I have lots of data and I want to extract signals. So I, I would say that um, this particular project is somewhat narrow in scope. It's a particular case where the top-down definition makes a lot of sense for the application. Um, I think it's a you know, open problem how you generalize these ideas so that um, it, you can kind of use them in conjunction with kind of uh, you know, arbitrary tasks. I think the first part of the talk about explanations is much more easily kind of widely use, usable. This, the second part is more, um, let's say, narrowly defined. Um, one thing maybe I, I can say is that um, I want to separate the fact that you're using definitions in the first place, which are high-level natural language guidance to a system, and our kind of grammar extraction um, strategy, which um, inherently is very taking your definitions at kind of face value. But you can imagine using the definitions in a more um, soft way. So you know, there has been some work of training classifiers, but you have explanations, or um, maybe you could do this for definitions too, that kind of regularize the classifier along some you know, directions. Um, or, I mean, even in a kind of very basic level, you can imagine doing whatever you're doing and then um, using the definitions as, as a way to you know, generate additional um, training data or you know, model structure or features that can go into the final prediction. Thank you, Percy. Okay.